because we can finally be who we are. Because we can finally be who we are, says Dexter. Those, uh, those final moments in this episode with Dexter, Quinn, Isaac, Hannah, Deborah, Aster, right? They're, they're Deborah and Aster, they're, they're strangely beautiful. Romeo, Tyrone, and Erica Mittman really brought their A-game to the table, as well as the cast and the crew, of course. You know, let's, let's, let's look at these people. We had Quinn riding herd over a Kashka drug deal, all because he cares for Nadia and for himself. Let's, you know, let's be honest there. We have Deborah confused about her own relationship with Dexter, needing a little something to get through her day. So she sits down with Aster, sees that she's smoking a joint, takes a spliff away, and rather than getting upset, she takes a well-deserved hit herself. You know, not the best parenting, but uh, she's not a parent. Ants can do things like that, I guess. Um, then we have Isaac listening to Vincent's final message to him. Now we understand that Vincent was his, his lover, the one great love in his life, really. And he's looking over the Miami skyline, forlorn. It's really sad, right? And finally, we got, uh, we got Dexter returning to Hannah. And he's being who he really is. He's holding Hannah in his arms, surrounded by mist and flowers. It's a good episode. Argentina. Well, welcome to the Dexter Wrap-Up Podcast for episode 708, Argentina. Like I said, written by Erica Mittman, directed by Romeo Tyrone. I'm your host, Scott Reynolds. I'm a writer-producer at Dexter. Your host, podcasting has become a way of life. Well, here's what we got going on. We'll talk a little bit more about this episode. Then we're going to hit up Romeo Tyrone. We're in Vancouver. We're directing another show. The guy's busy now. And uh, he's going to discuss Argentina, what it's like directing, working with the actors, what it was like making a transition from being the director of photography to, to, uh, to director, as well as you know all sorts of things of his storied career over here. Then we're going to go back in time. Yes, back in time. And we're going to answer your questions about episode 707, Chemistry, with writer Manny Cotto and showrunner Scott Buck. Karen Campbell, as you saw, also wrote this episode, but she decided to go get married in his honeymooning somewhere. Slacker. Anyway, let's talk about Argentina, which is not where Karen Campbell is. Um, Argentina, a lot of this episode deals with honesty, right? Which is a strange idea for Dexter. It's something he's yearned for over the years in his relationships, but, but ultimately it's something that he's not used to being honest, right? At least not until the people he's talking to are strapped down to a table, wrapped in plastic. I mean, he's always honest with the people he's about to kill. It's very controlled. And that honesty goes both ways. You know, they're going to admit what they've done, but it's under the threat of a knife or a bone saw or a drill or a chainsaw. You know, you get the picture. It's honesty with people he's in total control of. For Dexter, and I guess for all of us, really, honesty is, is laying oneself bare. It's risky. He puts himself on the table when he's, when he's honest like this especially for America's favorite serial killer, to be that honest. There's a lot at stake when Dexter's honest with others. That's not to say that Dexter's unfamiliar with the concept of honesty with regular folks. He he deals in half-truths all the time. It's the best way for him to survive. I mean, no one can live a life that is a total lie. Which brings us to the people in this episode that Dexter is in varying shades of truth with. Uh, It's it's Aster, Deborah, Isaac, and, of course, Hannah. So let's talk about these people. Aster. She's gone through a lot, thanks to Dexter. Or no thanks to Dexter. She's, she's lost her abusive father, Paul. Remember, that guy was, you know, not a good guy. It might have been a bit of a blessing that he went off to jail. But it's, it's hard to lose your dad. I mean, he died in jail. And she also lost her mother, Rita. And now she's living with her grandparents, and that can't be easy. So she needs a little release herself. Something Dexter's very familiar with, needing release. A little bit, but for her, it's a little bit of weed now and then. And Dexter understands this for, for release. So Dexter, upon finding out that she's packing a couple ounces of herb, is, is worried for his stepdaughter. He's got to have that talk. He's a serial killer, <laughs> having a talk about drugs. Oh, the irony. Well, anyway, he sits down with her, and he shares a startling truth, half-truth, but it's a truth that only we and, and Deborah, who's, you know, who says she's got Deborah's back on this with Aster, remember that moment on the beach. And honestly, I don't know who's less capable of of having this talk, you know, and Deborah or Dexter. But so Dexter says, sometimes the things you want in the moment, sometimes those, those vices cause more additional stress. Dexter knows what he's talking about, right? I I love when Dexter can be truthful in these, in these strangest of moments, telling this to the girl who lost Rita, her mother, because Dexter spent a little too much time uh, with a thing he wanted in the moment with, you know, hunting and, and talking with the Trinity killer. And sure, Aster treats this truth nugget like all te- te- uh, teenagers do when they talk with adults, but it hits home with her. 
for both Aster, Dexter, and Debra. And then there's, uh, the, speaking of Debra, Debra, the, the truth flowed both ways this episode and this relationship. Debra, last episode, asked Dexter to kill Hannah. Um, she deserves Dexter, t- Hannah deserves Dexter's table, right? She's killed and she will kill again. But unlike when Harry sent Dexter off to kill the nurse that was killing him, remember that in uh, season one? Dexter refuses to follow through and, and pulls back under the half truth of, if I kill Hannah because you asked for it, you will not be able to live yourself with, live with yourself, Deb, which is true. He's telling a truth here. He's being honest, but he hides the real truth from Deborah that, that Hannah and Dexter are seeing one another. And I can't help but feel that, that Dexter needs his secrets now. It's, it's, he's used to living a life in the darkness of secrecy. And this living in the full light of day is something that takes a lot of getting used to, especially with Deb. But then his secret relationship with, H- with Hannah is laid bare with Deborah when she recognizes that keychain. You know, he's borrowing the van from Hannah, which leads Deborah to finally bear her soul before Dexter and telling him that she was or is, she's not even, she's unsure about all this, but she is in love with him. And we get that moment when Dexter, it's rare, but Dexter is truly stunned. He has, he has no uh, idea or clue how to process this, much less react to it. I'm in love with you, she says. And in, and in Dexter's stunned silence, Deborah says, you're a serial killer and I'm more f***ed up than you are. Followed by the only response that any male knows how, what to say in, in, in moments like this. I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. <laughs> in that moment, Dexter's, I swear to God, he's like every other guy I know, me, me included. We just don't know what to say. But Dexter's being honest in that moment, right? Also including uh, Isaac. There's Isaac. Dexter finally caught up with the truth of who Isaac is. And again, Dexter is like genuinely befuddled when he realizes why Isaac is in a gay bar. He's not just hiding out. He's not just trying to be somewhere safe. He's, he's gay. Uh, but because Dexter is in the full blush of a relationship with Hannah, he understands what Dexter's going through. He even offers something he's never really done before. He offers a pass. Just walk away. It's the only logical thing, right? But in matters of the heart, logic doesn't reign. Uh, but through Isaac, Dexter learns that the best we can hope for in this world, as Isaac says, is a place where we don't have to pretend. They both live these... These, lie, these lives of pretending they're something that they're not. They're outsiders, as he says. And this hits home for Dexter. I mean, somewhere in the back of his head, you know, he's always, Dexter's always known this. But Isaac puts, uh, he somehow puts Isaac, or Dexter's coffee pressed down feelings that he can't describe into, into words and contracts, constructs that Dexter can understand. And I believe, too, that in another world, Dexter and Isaac would be great friends. Don't you? Yeah. P.S. Uh, when Isaac got up and left that bar, you know Dexter was hit on as soon as Isaac left that bar. But that's another discussion, I guess. Finally, we got Hannah. Hannah. He found someone in which he can be completely open and honest with. Just just like normal people, you know, are, he, he probably imagines them to be, even though we're never really completely honest with people, I guess. Um, it's just, it's the most imp- I think it's the most important move in this episode. Dexter found someone with, with whom he can be absolutely and completely honest. He found it in some way with Aster. Right, little little ways, and with Deborah, but nothing like the way he does with Hannah. It's unconditional. I mean, honesty is even found in small ways, like when he asks Hannah, "What's a booty call?" <laughs> right? In any other conversation, like, like let's say that happened at the station with Masuka or whoever, uh, Dexter would have just tried to go along with it. He would have nodded his head, made a small laugh, tried to be one of the guys, and then his voiceover would have said, "What's a booty call?" And we would have laughed. It would have been funny. But with Hannah, uh, he his his inner voice is being is is out loud he says it he says everything out loud his his inner voice is quieted and it's all external i mean this is important what is a booty call is an important moment in in, in this relationship with dexter and then dexter gets to come home to her later and and uh and she says like any other tv show wife or girlfriend i I, I have real ones too uh she says how was your day i mean sure rita asked him that back in the day but but he was never able to tell her what you know i killed a killed a pedophile killer and took him out in a boat and dumped his dumped him out it was great he never he never shared anything like that with him he was never able to unburden himself but with hannah he talks like they're i don't know like a regular couple in love with one another caring for one another he he tells hannah that that he's got some troubles the freaking godfather of the kashka brotherhood is trying to kill him and uh they they process this through and she even helps him if you remember and dexter feels good and honest and open and this is new territory for him. Now, let's you know, let's be honest. How safe can one be in a relationship with with a, with a killer? 
that remains to be seen. But in the moment, it's nice to see Dexter finding an open and honest talk with someone who's not wrapped in plastic and about to be chopped up into pieces, right? Anyway, enough of all this. You want to hear from the director of Argentina, Romeo Tyrone? I'm imagining a lot of people with their earbuds in nodding their head, which I will take as an affirmation to move forward from all my jibber-jabber. Romeo's got some good stuff to say about other things that happened during this episode, too. It's great. Let's go talk to, uh, to Romeo. Hey, so I'm sitting here with Romeo Tyrone, uh, the uh, director of episode 708. How you doing, Romeo? Oh, I'm great, Scott. How are you? I am great. Yeah, yeah, we're doing we're doing good. As you can tell, uh, Romeo is on the phone because uh, ever since he made the jump to director, like everybody wants him. True. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm very lucky. Uh, you know, being on Dexter for so long, it's really um, given me a lot of good chops and a lot of good connections, and uh, people are hiring me. So yeah, it's people wonderful. people love what you did. So it's, you bet you you came on to Dexter like since episode uh, two, and then did how many episodes? You said. Um, I, uh, as a director of photography, I shot 60 episodes of Dexter from Whoa. season one through season six. Every single, yeah. wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There's of the, of the six seasons, there's 12 I didn't do. One was the pilot. Uh, uh four of them were, I directed and of great. those that I directed, there were four that I had to prep and then three that I, um, I came in into an episode, a season late. So did you? Did you? I can't, I can't remember. Did you direct uh, and DP one season? Well, yeah. I was. I, every time I, I would shoot, but uh, the episodes that I directed, uh, I had someone else come in and, and shoot for me. But I right, just right. bumped up uh, Marty, um, oh, right. my operator. That's right. That's right. That's cool. So uh, how did you get into this whole uh, DP thing? How did this come about? Um, you know, I, um, I started, you know, I went to school at St. John's for communication arts and oh. kind of not really knowing what I wanted to do. And that's the, one that's the beauty of communication arts that you, yeah, you get to do it and you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, you get to, you get to feel everything. <laughs> I knew I, I liked television cause I spent so much time in front of it as a child and <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, uh, you know, I explored that and there was one practical filmmaking class and it was a professor who, um, uh, who was a, a, a documentary editor. Okay. And in, it was the only thing that you actually made a film, and it was like falling off a chair to get an A in the class. So <laughs> I kind of, it pointed me in the right direction. And this is an interesting class because seven years later, Marco Siega, who oh, yeah. directed lots of uh, Dexters, he was in that class. Get out. And That's Louis good. Schiffer, um, the editor, who's also an Emmy Award winning editor. Yeah, yeah, we just editor, talked with him. Yeah, he he also went to this, the same class which, uh, with Don Finnamore. So it was uh, one of those places and one of those people who were uh, inspired a lot of people. Wow. Uh, I ended up then, from there, I got a job at General Camera in New York, and I was a camera technician. Okay. And I worked my way up through there uh, from, like, you know, just being a technician on heads and mags, and then I started getting into camera. Then I became a lens technician, and I went out as a uh, camera assistant. Uh, as freelance and uh, doing music videos mostly, and uh, my first job was Run DMC Aerosmith Walk This Way. No way! Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> so that was a, like it was a time when music videos were really popping, and and yeah. everyone like was anyone can do them. And I was working with a cameraman who was doing commercials during the week and music videos on the weekends. And through his his name was Tony Mitchell, and okay. he did like Eyes Without a Face. He did he, he did like so many amazing things. We I, we did um, an evening in black and white with Roy Orbison. Oh uh, yeah, he directed and shot that. So I, I I was doing a lot of music, and through those connections, I ended up uh, being in L.A. and stayed in L.A. and I started shooting music videos because it was uh, I got the same pay for being a starving cameraman as I did for being a starving camera assistant. <laughs> <laughs> That's and a- uh, through music videos, you know, I, I worked in you know lots of. Uh, you know, through rock and roll, lots of hair bands, and, uh, yeah. you know, I shot Ozzy Osbourne, and, and then the mu- music changed, and I shot, like, uh, hardcore rap, Public Enemy, Ice Cube, Ice T, and then I got married and moved back to New York, and I took my hardcore rap and my hair bands, and I cut it to classical music, and I got hired as a camera, uh, as a, sorry, to shoot commercials, Okay. and the first man that hired me was Mike Quester Sr., oh. which was Michael Quest Jr.'s father, and um, shot the pilot. that was, like, yeah. an amazing break for me and then my relationship with Michael Cuesta you know grew and um, we ended up shooting a film called LIE yep 
Oh, that, that was a tough that one got, too. That was yeah, a great it was movie. Crazy. And that got a lot of attention at Sundance in like 2000. And then Michael went on to do the pilot of Dexter. Yeah. And once it went to series, he called me in, and I was lucky that Clyde uh, was Clyde Phillips, who was the showrunner at the time, uh, took a chance on me. And it was uh, my first foray into television. And I think one of the reasons why Dexter has a look that doesn't look like anything on TV, at least at the time, yeah. it was because I really hadn't done any TV, and so I just you know, did things that look good and tried to make everything as interesting as possible. No, you totally did. It's, it it sweats Miami in, in a way that no other show ever had. Yeah, it, was, it looks gorgeous. You changed TV. Way to go, Romeo. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like everybody's sort of copying you now, huh? Not everybody. I, but it, uh, there's a, you know, there's a few like shows. That... Progresses. I think I think the idea that <laughs> um, that things should be interesting and, and character driven, I think, in television, I think, you know, again, being with Showtime and, and cable shows gave uh, the freedom yeah. that you would normally only have on, in movies. Yeah. And I think that's one of the great things about Dexter, because it would not be a show. Uh, it wouldn't be the show it is if it was on a network right now. Yeah, in the beginning, a lot of the directors were indie movie guys it seemed like that yeah came Kim from Gordon that. yeah uh, Ernest Dickerson um I John Dahl I worked like uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Michael Cuesta. I mean, yeah, everyone sure. was uh, was always trying to do push the envelope a little bit, and I was lucky enough to be able to work with all these really great directors and facilitate them and see what worked, what didn't work, and 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 try to uh, create environments. I think that's one of the best things of of what I've did with Dexter is I created environments for, for Michael to be in, for Michael C. Hall to be in, and for or the actors to be in. So it wasn't like we were just shooting shots. We would, especially kill scenes. I mean, kill yeah. scenes, most of them were, were run end to end with handheld cameras, two handheld cameras. And in the, in like a lot of the early stuff, I did all the handheld work. And I think that gave it this other sense of realism that you really felt you were right there and all the performances were just so great. Oh, that that uh, that kill of the nurse. Remember that? Yeah, yeah that, I mean that flashback to Dexter's first kill. Yeah, we, we we shot it in a in a small bungalow across the street from the studio, and it was like again low ceilings. All these things where I think maybe a more experienced DP would have walked in and said, "No, I can't shoot here. There's, the ceilings <laughs> are so low and everything." But because of that, it forced me to make the lighting different and make the environment different and. Uh, and and again, there's, I don't think there's a scene, at least then, like that was what that scene was, where it's young Dexter sticking a knife and getting into a, a nurse, a woman, and <laughs> yeah. getting sprayed with blood while he's wearing a, uh, well, a Mr. rain jacket. Well, Mr. Tinker watches <laughs> the cat. <laughs> Mr. Tinkers. Yeah, there, there was that, there's a wonderful darkness to the humor in Dexter that kind of was interwoven with you know with everything that happened in the day i think that's what made dexter very unique because you know even i was skeptical when i saw the pilot first when i was up for the job that if this was something that people would watch because the hero was a serial killer yeah 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 you know and then the tagline like was you know a serial killer that kills serial killers and everyone i ever said that to always get intrigued by it and there is something very intriguing about it. Yeah, there's a little wish fulfillment going on, you know, for, for sure, whether, whether we like it or not. Um, right. So when you were uh, – who was I talking with? I was, I, was, uh, I was on set the other day, and they, they were talking – I think it was, it was uh, one, of the, one of the actors was talking about the kill room and how at one time, you know, everybody sort of, sort of uh, applauded the, this, some sort of kill scene. It was, it was a couple seasons ago. It was like Dexter and the bad guy and – and then I think it was Mike. I think they said that Michael said, or so, someone said, no, it's not just us. It's it's the camera. It's 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 uh, the camera in this in this room that we're not aware of. And and I feel like you're the guy that's. It sounds like you're the guy that sort of made that a safe place to do this. You know, this crazy thing that's never been on t- done on TV before. That and not being yeah. One of the greatest and, things uh, about it is that you know the victims are wrapped in plastic. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when you take there, – there was a moment, like, when we were preparing for, like, the first one. Okay. Uh, it might have been the nurse. I can't remember. But there was a thing about nudity. Like, we didn't want to 
you know, see somebody wrapped in plastic and see that they were, they, we, we wanted them, obviously, it, it was, they were supposed to be nude underneath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we didn't want it just to be blatant and distracting. Yeah, yeah. So I took a light from above, and, and we always kind of said that Dexter would have, you know, wherever he was, he'd be able to, like, he had clip lights, and he would create this, you know, light for it, and he would, the, the light would be a big light that bounced off the plastic, and I did it to make it, because we were shooting uh, HD, and it would blow out yeah what was ever underneath the plastic. So you knew the person was nude, but you really couldn't see anything. And yeah. what happened was the light that bounced off the plastic lit the rest of the room. So then it became like a one light scenario where we wow. would do a kill room, light it from one light from above, maybe a few, he'd always have another light on his kill tools. And then Michael had the freedom to walk around as Dexter and, and have this conversation, this, these cathartic conversations with these victims before he killed them. Yeah. And I think that freedom of not having to say, oh, you can't go there, you can't go there, or, you know, stop here because you'll be in the light, and uh, made it so that um, Michael C. Hall was able to go as far as he wanted with it. That's amazing. That's And, yeah, you you, told, it, you see it now in every kill scene. Um, so yeah. when you were... Uh, and, and then we you know, also changed the colors, too, which, like, you know, it, it, it would be every every kill had a different feel and a different look, but it was still the same kind of motif, which was uh, I always found... Uh, very creatively wonderful. So that's the thing about DPs. You handle the lighting, right? Like, why don't you just lay out for for people that may not know? Because this is go, you know this is going out everywhere. Sure. What, sure. Exactly what a DP uh, does. Director of photography right. is uh, is a title of this for the cinematographer on on a TV show or or anything. And basically, uh, I'm in charge of the lighting and the camera, the camera lenses, and, like, everything. Basically, the director comes in and says what he wants, and the director of photography makes it happen. I, I basically okay. run the crew. Um, my, my gaffer is my lighting technician, and he basically I'll tell him how I want the light to be. He'll put it up. Uh, the camera operators, I kind of design the shots. Again, I, like, I, my style was always to create environments that, that the actors could move through, so we would always have the cameras be moving and following the actors. Uh, so as a director of photography, that's pretty much, you know, I'm, you know, direct, director comes in and my job is to interpret what's visually in the director's head and get it onto whatever medium we're shooting on. And then in TV, you sort of offer, because, you know, in TV, different director comes every week, All, you know, it's, it's yeah. c- continuous. So you offer sort of a, I don't know, a steady vision, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I always kind of took it as like I'm the keeper of the look. Okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. when a director would come in, he would tell me what he wanted to do. And I was always very open, especially with there was a lot of creative directors, yeah. to kind of whatever style they wanted to shoot in. But there was always a look that I was making sure that I kept it so that it always looked like a Dexter shot or a Dexter scene. And um, it became... It, later on in the seasons, directors would come in and they would be studying previous episodes of previous seasons uh-huh. and say, oh, I love this, I want to do it. I found that very interesting. Cause I would, wow. And I would always say, no, let's do something different because we already did that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So as, as there... But it was always a progression. And like keeping, as a director of photography on a TV show, yeah, you're, you, you have to keep it, the continuity of it. I always... And like every director that comes in, there's there's a... A different approach. Some some directors are really good with actors. Right. So as it's like Keith Gordon, I have, right? Like people like Keith Gordon, like people like Keith Gordon, and who? Are, yeah. yeah, yeah. Keith Gordon always has a, a visual sense, and and then he's because really, he's an actor, he's really yeah. good with the actors. So as a cinematographer, I have to kind of mold myself to the director that comes in. So if they're really visual, then I'll kind of key off of that. And if they're really only dealing with the actors, then I'll make sure that I fill in the blanks on the visual part. Okay. And uh, it's an interesting um, exercise. And I have to say, in the six years that I did it on Dexter, six seasons, I, I, it was an education every time I got on the set and uh, a rich life experience that I, I'll carry with me all the time. So, we, you know, we, we, we uh, talked with Daniel Licht, you know, the, the composer, and he was, talking, he was telling us about how uh, each each character has sort of like their own theme. Um, is there, is there something like that going on in, on Dexter? You already talked about a kill room, how that has sort of a different look. Did you, did yeah, well, there's definitely, um, starting with Dexter, there were two looks for Dexter. Okay. Um, the everyday look, which when, when Dexter was the lab geek, the blood spatter expert, we really, I front lit Michael's face. 
And Michael has his face, he's very handsome, and he can be very sweet-looking. So that's how Dexter was as a, as a technician. And then in Top Light, which became the motif for all the kill rooms or when Dexter uh, was his dark passenger, okay. his eye sockets are kind of deep, and so his eyes would go really dark, and he would become very sinister. Wow. And Michael would play off of that. And yeah. I think that's like one of the main things as far as character lighting that we had. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, it was really good, and and the sun, the sun, like well, I think in in the pilot, the, there's there was something. I think when he's going to the pool to see the the first ice truck killer victim, yeah. he says something about how this blood and gore in the Miami sunshine kind of puts a whole other light on it, and uh, we took that, and and I took that, and everywhere. I could. I always made sure that that sun was penetrating because you know, and when you're in Florida, the sun is penetrating, yeah. and it, it's always you know creeping into the rooms. And I we we try to make people be sweaty when they're outside just to make it feel real. And I think that realism came through because we shoot this all in Long Beach and San Pedro, and then here at Sunset Gower Studios. Yeah, not Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it feels like Miami. There, I have friends that live in Miami who ask me all the time, where, so where exactly did you shoot this in Miami? And then I tell right. them it's not there. They, they don't believe it. And that's, you know, that is, that's the lighting. That's the, the way you guys film it. Um, it's so true. Trinity, was, were, were things shot differently with him? Was the same sort of thing going on? or do you remember? Well, you know, John Lithgow, another amazing actor. Um, yeah, he had the same him. kind of qualities, you know? Yeah. You, you, his face, like he, again, I, I think good actors have complete control over every nuance on their face and the muscles in their face. Um, and and uh, John Lithgow was uh, amazing at that. Yeah. Um, Trinity, again, he was a dichotomy just like Dexter. He was a family man, a churchgoer. He was a preacher, like, you know. Yeah. And, and then when he got sinister, it was the same kind of thing. You know, we okay. would make him, he, he'd get dark. And, um, you know, it, it, I think the combination of just enough change in the light and then let the actor be. And again, I, I, I one of the things that I've learned, and if I was ever to teach cinematography, I would always say the best shot is when you have your actors free enough to do whatever they want, because most of the time that's going to be the thing that makes it great. Wow. Okay. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- so this... Um this transition from uh, DP cinematographer to director, that happened. It sounds like it happened because you're. Is this something you always wanted to do, or is it working yeah, on I Dexter? Think, um, I, I I think I've always been inspired to do it. Like when I did music videos, I dabbled in directing music videos. When I did commercials, I would shoot and direct commercials. Okay. Like I I always kind of wanted to be in charge, and some of it's a little selfish because I wanted to kind of get the middleman. Out from in front of my uh, cinematography, so I didn't have to. I was going to ask you that. How, to yeah. person. <laughs> How do you handle that relationship now? Because now you're you're popping around all sorts of different shows, and you're a you know this amazing DP. It, it's Is interesting. It, it, I I really because like um, again, I had such great experience working with such great actors. Sure. I really focus on performance when I'm directing. Okay. Um, the cinematography. The I'm very good at blocking. Again working in the trenches every day, you know, working 14 hours a day, I, I kind of, the blocking comes very easy to me to make sure what's efficient to be filmed, for, you know, uh, schedule friendly. Yeah. Uh, so what I try to do is I focus on performance and little by little, I've been able to walk away from the cinematography, uh, say, this is what I want and walk away. <laughs> I mean, obviously when I was on Dexter, I, I was still pretty much lighting it. I mean, I had Marty, uh, who's my operator and he would be, uh, in charge and lighting it, but he was still someone who worked for me, so I, I had a lot of influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I've worked on different shows, and uh, I have certain friends who I've worked with, just uh, people I've known in the business, and there's a collaboration there. And then there's others who I work with who I just try to say, okay, I'm just going to walk away and see what they come up with. <laughs> and uh, there, there, I in my prep, I kind of try to point the camera, or have the plan to point the camera in the right direction. And again, try to make it so that we're efficient in our blocking, so that I can spend more time shooting than lighting and changing the setups. Right, right. So seven. Let's talk about seven oh eight here. Um, yeah, Argentina. Argentina. A lot of it was. It was uh, uh, it's a fun episode. A lot of surprises. <laughs> right, and you, yeah. and, and you get to work with um, with Isaac, uh, with Ray Stevenson. 
Ray Stevens was fantastic. Uh, he's a great actor. Yeah, he's fantastic. really great actor. I think one of the best things about Dexter, the show, is it attracts really, really good actors, and and that's a you know, it's the characters that you guys create, the writers create. Once they 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 breathe into these actors that just take it and create these details with them, that it just. It takes the show over the top, and I think that's what makes a great show. Yeah, we're very, we're very lucky, man. <laughs> These people. Yes. Um, yes. So well, it's again, it tracks, you know, greatness attracts greatness. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this episode was a lot of secrets being uh, unfolded. It was a lot, you know, it was a lot of conversations from from you know uh, what's her uh, Deborah admitting her big moment with Dexter, which was yeah. an incredible scene, by the way. You, did, you, that was, uh, oh, you know, it's so funny. When I read the script, I thought, wow, wait a minute. This isn't like scripts that I've directed previously, which had a lot of action and a lot yeah. of, like, you know, there wasn't a kill in it. And it's like there's a lot of people just talking in a room, and I was a little nervous about it. And the it's, it was completely opposite of what I thought it would be because yeah. it's so intriguing. I mean, the relationship with Deborah and Dexter has been, uh, like, right from the beginning, something that they're, they were so symbiotic with each other. Like, you know, when Deborah was trying to become uh, a detective, it was Dexter who would always give her the little hints of things that, you know, his instincts yeah. of how to catch serial killers and how to catch people. And, you know, I guess growing up with all the flashbacks that we did, we always told the story of, you know, Deborah wanting Harry's attention, but Dexter always getting it and not really understanding why. So I think that want for Harry's attention and that love for her brother now is kind of coming to a head. And in this scene, this episode where she professes her love for him. I'm in you know, love with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the greatest line ever is, you're a serial killer, and I'm more f***ed up than you. <laughs> you know, it's just like yeah. a, an amazing cathartic moment, because it, it's, you know, a lot of times shows will go on and on, and then if you really list everything that happened to a character, no human could probably deal with that. Right. And right. I loved it that Deborah basically listed it. Now all of a sudden she says, no wonder why, you know, the ice truck killer and all my relationships with Lundy and everything, I always have, you know, relationships that go to yeah. It's because of my relationship with Dexter. Yeah, you know? it was like it's the great, key great that unlocked it, every part of her life. And uh, yeah. what I loved was, um, let's, let's talk about this moment where it's that, it's that line that you had just said. And her response isn't like this, isn't, um, cause she's cried, you know, she's been very, she's a, yes. she's someone who wears her, her emotions on her sleeves. Right. But, uh, she didn't necessarily cry in that moment. She had this, uh, grin, <laughs> this crazy yeah. grin. Yeah. I think it's a cathartic moment for her. Cause all of a sudden she realizes all the things that she didn't understand about her life, why it was pretty much up in a, in a sense she all of a sudden found it there and it actually becomes funny and she looks at Dexter and she's like don't you have anything to say <laughs> and it's like Dexter turns back into Dexter from season one where yeah. he doesn't know how to express emotion or relate to people and it's re you realize after all these years he's never really progressed about how to deal with feelings with you know with the relationships around him. Well, it's like almost every so, guy in some way. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, yeah, in that moment, it's just like, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't even think it was that bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you know what? This, this season is really great, and, and it kind of comes up. Uh, the transition happens in, in this episode in Argentina where, yeah. you know, obviously Deb finds out about Dexter. Dexter now doesn't have to lie to Deb anymore. So there's a moment, oh, great, I don't have to lie to Deb. But then Hannah comes in the picture. And yep. the first thing he That's has to this do, other secret. you know, mm -hmm. in my episode, is he has to lie to Deb. And Deb is kind of vetting Hannah. He says, okay, listen. He's like, all of a sudden now Deb becomes his Robin and saying, you know, to his Batman and saying, okay, hey, listen, you can get this guy. Because you can get her because she did this, this, and this. And then, like, you know, she fits your code. Let's go get her. And now Dex has to lie to her again. Yeah. And, and says, it's, he's no, uncomfortable. I don't He's un you, you captured this uncomfortableness that isn't normally on Dexter. Because he can lie yeah. and lie and lie all day long and doesn't bother him at all. 
Exactly. Yeah. And he's good at it. Yeah. And he's so good at it about expressing emotions through observation that he really doesn't have that all of a sudden you almost felt like he did feel the frustration. Yeah. You know, and again, I hands off, you know, my, I applaud Michael C. Hall for being able to put that subtlety in those scenes. And, and the same thing with Jennifer Carpenter. You know, there's this whole moment of, of, you know, realization, okay, I accept Dexter for what he is. And in fact, I'm going to help him. And he is doing something that maybe there is some good in it. Because, you know, the whole basis of why Dexter, we all like Dexter, is because yeah. he tries to only kill bad people. And Deb, that's all Deb wants to do. Deb only just wants to capture and, and like, put people in jail who are doing bad things. Yep. So she's like, okay, I'm going to get on the bandwagon. And Dex's like, no, nah, no, nah, we can't do that. I can't. I can't. And he says, it's you, not me. I don't want you to be involved. Meanwhile, he's lying to her again about Hannah. Yeah, and it's at that, that moment, uh, it's, like, it's another one of those amazing moments, I thought, that, that he, Dexter is telling the truth when he tells Deb, I don't want you to go down this trail. I don't want you to be responsible for killing somebody. But, but it's also a complete lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's so rich. It's, exactly. it's very fun. <laughs> it, it is. It's so layered and rich. And and I wonder if she came up with another victim, uh, another person to kill. Then maybe he said, "Okay, great, let's go do it." You yeah. Know, oh, yeah. Keep her occupied. <laughs> <laughs> but because it's Hannah, and now again, what what Dexter sees in Hannah is someone he can be tremendously honest with. Yep. You, you know that. With, yeah, that was uh, another scene in your episode here. That 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 that, uh, yes. that moment where it just dawns on him that I've never been able to talk. To anyone like this, yes, yeah, straight up, not having she wasn't shocked or anything like you know, no judgment. Uh, one of the first you know relationships that we saw that was in season two with Lila. Yeah, but Lila was crazy. Lila was crazy, you and know, Lila, Lila got off a little bit on what he was too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And now Hannah is just accepting it yep. for what it is. You know, there's no she's, emotional kind of reaction to it. She's like, be and careful. I, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Be careful. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs> You know, it, like, Dexter had a lie to Reader his, every time. Everything was a lie, lie, lie. In fact, there was so many lies on top of lies that uh, I, I couldn't even imagine him being so compartmentalized that he was able to get through that relationship, you know, more yeah. than, than he has. And then, and then obviously with Trinity killing her, it, it turns everything on its head. Yeah. Um, and then let's talk about the, that final, uh, the final reveal. Where uh, what is it with um, Lewis? And, I'm not sorry. Did I say Lewis? I mean uh, Isaac. Yeah, Isaac and Dexter in that bar. Again, I, uh, Dexter. I, one of the things I think that makes Dexter addicted to to these moments that he does, these, yeah. ki these killings, is that he gets to have an honest moment with ever the person he he has on this table and, yeah. it, and it happened it's happened in every kill room it's always something he learns and there's always something very cathartic for him and i think that's really a bit of the the, the addiction so now here it's a total he has all bar. this control over it you know it's like i can tell you this i can be honest and open up with myself i can tell you how i'm feeling and then i can end it boom <laughs> i can kill you yes. <laughs> it's and, over and then i don't have to worry about the repercussions of telling you that because i'm going to kill you and right. you deserve to die <laughs> yeah well now he's in a situation with Isaac yep. in the bar, and he follows him in, and he's, his plan is, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, his plan is impetuous, too, and, you know, his whole conversation with Harry in the van is like, I'm going to do this and this and this, and Harry's I like, need wait it. a minute, the cops are outside, you can't do that, you know, and he's like, you should wait, and he's like, okay, I'm going to wait, I'm not waiting anymore, yeah. and he's going in, so now, <laughs> it's Dexter's a little bit out of control, Yes, and he goes in there thinking he's going to maybe stick him and then carry him out. Like a it's drunk buddy. It's a half-cocked plan, it's so yeah. not Dexter. Yeah. And then Isaac basically meets him eye to eye and head to head, and then all of a sudden creates a situation where it's like, okay, hey, we're both going to be honest with each other. Yeah, I've got and secrets I, too. I, it's great scene. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How, um, how do you work those? Uh, you know, you've been on Dexter for such a long time. Do you just sort of let the actors roll this thing out in, in those sort of scenes because they sort of know what they're doing, or is there a lot of times that they lean into you a little bit to ask you questions? How did you handle all that stuff on on this episode? Because it was it really was like a lot of incredibly uh, deep and hard conversations. Yeah, I mean, again, obviously Michael C. Hall and and Jennifer Carpenter right. have been on forever. Yeah. In there. Um, Ray Stevenson, he that that scene in the bar was a five-page scene, yeah. which is basically almost one long monologue. 
that Ray had. Yeah. Um, I think with with Ray, I kind of we we guided through it. I mean, he's such a good actor; his instincts were right on. There were, there were really nothing, no huge adjustments. Right. With Deborah, because my history, I'm sorry, with Jennifer, because of my history with her, I um I actually texted her like a week before we shot it and asked her if there's anything she wanted, she needed or wanted, uh, you know, cause it, it was, it's, a, I knew it was going to be a hard scene yeah. and she, she actually thanked me for, you know, being concerned and understanding that I'm, she might need anything, but she's kind of felt like she had a handle on it. That's good. So the only thing that I did when I went in there just to make sure as a, as a, an observer, like watching the performance going on that, there was a continuity within, because obviously, you know, you know how we shoot. We shoot the wide shot, then we go in tighter and tighter. Right. One thing she did ask me, and I, I did accommodate, uh, she wanted to do the close-up and the medium shot at the same time, which I was able to work out with the two cameras. Again, my, my experience as a, a cinematographer, was able, I was able to do it so that when we cut from one take to the other, they were actually, act, you know, cuts of the same take. So right. that there was a oh. really great continuity of from the mediums to the close up. So we did one take of the wide, and you know there were moments where she, I remember she ended one take thinking, "She goes, okay, I'm a crazy person, ain't I?" <laughs> and it was like, "Yeah, you are." And I remember using it in the cut, you know, to act to pepper it up, to accentuate it, like cut out to the wide, and she was like a little over the top. Yeah. But I think as a director, what you have to do with especially with actors that are so good, you just have to kind of keep an eye on them and and be honest with them in your observation of it so that they can take it, hone it to a place that's in the right spot. Most of the time, their instincts are really great. Right. And I'm also balancing with, you know, uh, with the writing staff, too, who, who in my tone meeting say, okay, we want it to be this, this, and this, with Scott Buck and Erica. You know, they, they just wanted to make sure that it didn't go to a certain direction. So yeah. I would try to balance that with what the actors bring and then come, make sure I come with something that's really dramatic. And like I said, I was a little, uh, like, because the script had so many scenes like that, I was like, wow, this is, this is either going to be fantastic or really boring. And <laughs> it, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. <laughs> it is. It is. And yeah, I, I would feel like if I, if I were, I'm not a director, but if I were to be able to direct a uh, Dexter episode, the first thing I would do is, like, rip through the pages to look for my kill scene. Yeah. No kill scene. You, you, not for you. Exactly not this time. <laughs> <laughs> because that's that's the core of what Dexter is. That's that's the honest moments yeah. in Dexter. Oddly enough, you know, it's not it's not gratuitous violence. There's something that always goes on with it. Yeah. And um I was like, hey, I have to say, I was disappointed that I didn't have a kill. <laughs> um so but uh but it, I think it's But you killed nonetheless out. though man you killed nonetheless yeah. it's a it's a great episode and uh and I tell you everybody's everybody's always happy uh both up here in the writing area and down on the set when when Romeo Tyrone shows up you're well loved uh, out on this end man That's great I'm I'm so lucky I'm going to be part of season 8 too I have an episode in season 8 that I'll do and I'm I'm so excited Woo-hoo. about that Hey, man, so thank you so much for taking some time. I know you're like, uh, I'm talking to you, you're in Vancouver. Yeah, working with Melissa Rosenberg. Oh, that's right. For, yeah, she was with, she was with yeah. Dexter for the first four seasons. Her Dexter She's, friend. Tell her we yeah. said hey. She's great. I will. All right, thanks again. And, uh, cool, you know. God, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Hey, Scott Buck. Hello, Scott Reynolds. How you doing? I'm good, thanks. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing good. All is well. Sitting here also with uh, Manny Koto. Howdy. Howdy. I like it. Like mm. a... Howdy. <laughs> it's like a cowboy. Thanks for coming in and uh, for uh, taking some time to talk about last week's episode, Chemistry. We should, we should uh, say that Karen Campbell also wrote it with you, right, Manny? Yes, she did. And, and she's uh, not here. She's not here, and for very good reason. She yeah. went off and got hitched. She got married. That's funny. You just said it was for very good reason. I don't think mm-hmm. I've very, ever heard well, you admit that. Before. It's good for her. Okay, it's good for her. <laughs> we're, we're all different, and you know. So she's on she, her honeymoon in uh, Hawaii or Fiji or someplace. I think it's a testament to how much she cares about this show that she let something like a honeymoon <laughs> get in the way of a broadcast, mm-hmm. of, of a, a podcast, podcast for for Dexter. Uh, I'm very disappointed in her. We're gonna have to we have to examine her contract. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll let you handle that. Um, uh, so you and Karen wrote chemistry together. We did. How did, how does, how does that work? I think a lot of people want to know how, 
how writing an episode together works. Cause, you know, well, it, it could be it, for different people. I, I imagine it works differently. I know there are writing teams and partners that. You know, well, I, I've written with someone in the past as a partner, and you basically sit in a room and, and come up with uh, line by line together. Uh, in this situation, you know, since we're not a team, we're two different right. writers. It was it was kind of we just split the work apart. You know, we, it was it was developed more or less like every other episode where it's in mostly you know is outlined in the writers' room and right. the beats are, are put down and what have you. And when it comes time to write, basically we just I, I took part one and she took part two. And then right. uh, we you know we we wrote those pages, put them together, and then gave each other notes. And uh, and then uh, you know uh, try to smooth it out. So it's because if you, if you have two parts like that, it comes back like two different writers wrote them. Right. And so you know in the noting process, you kind of smooth it out, and ultimately you know you end up with uh, with a script. And it worked out very well. And Scott Buck looks it over. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, so and it, this this episode turned out amazing. Uh, people are Thank loving you. it. Chemistry. Yeah. I was very title. happy with it. Talk, I was tell me about the favorite. title. So it's chemistry. Well, it's it's you know in, in in the end of obviously what what the, the title means is uh, you know the chemistry between uh, uh, Dexter and uh, Hannah Hannah, Hannah. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot her name. It's too early in the Why morning. Yvonne Stryker, as she is known in, in, in <laughs> certain Yvonne circles. Strahovski. <laughs> Yvonne Strahovski, Dexter and Hannah. I mean, in the last episode, you know, ended pretty explosively with, yeah. with Dexter and Hannah and, and, and Hannah on the table, and this picks up right after, and and it kind of examines. You know, it kind of deepens their their bond, and the title chemistry is you know two people who share this kind of chemistry. And what I liked about the, the chemistry uh, 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 analogy is that you know sometimes when chemicals mix, they can turn into something very beneficial, but sometimes they can explode. Right. And that that was kind of an analogy we used through the script, which I thought was very um, apropos to these two. It's very and it's very important to have those two things, right? Because uh, I guess Lewis is going to talk to us later about this episode. Right. And uh, and he talks about how when he was putting it together, he originally was thinking of it like a like a romantic a romantic episode, and huh. you you guys came in and said, uh, "Don't think of it this way." Yeah, I didn't. I never. I didn't really see it as kind of a romantic. Ep- I, I saw it more of like it, you know, it's more of like a, a dark uh, kind of uh, obsessive love right. situation between the two of them. That you know, Dexter's trying to resist this. This this you know dry feel he has toward her um, because he knows damn well this is this is this is not going to turn out well right. in the end and this episode is the first challenge to that where you know she she kills she kills Sal Price and it's and it's Dexter realizing that he you know he's basically getting on a horse he can't really quite control if you excuse the metaphor. tiger by the tail tiger by the tail yeah right you got a you got a metaphor Scott Buck I do not okay <laughs> oh uh, some people have some questions for it for mm-hmm. you guys. Um, First one is uh, Deb Sh- Deb on Facebook, not Deborah, I guess. I Probably Deb. not. Uh, Deb on Facebook asks: Dexter seems emotionally distraught and confused by his two primal needs, according to her, which are lust and killing. Like it's getting too much to handle at the moment. Is this having a crazy effect on Deborah? Is her? It, does she have her own dark passenger coming out? Is she evolving to be like her brother? I do no. Deborah does not have a dark passenger right. on her own, and. He, no, she's not even fully aware of what's going on with Hannah at all at this time, but it's right. certainly going to have an effect on her should she ever discover. I think one of the reasons we we, we knew that Dexter and Deborah were going to go through this big emotional journey this season, and we, one of the reasons I think we we brought Hannah in is because it's always first of all more interesting when you have a you know a triangle rather yeah. than, than just two people, and I think she is definitely going to be. You know, someone who gets in, in, you know, as the episodes move on, you'll and the audience will see where she fits in between Deborah and Dexter. But right now, it's as Scott said, I think it's too early for for Deborah to really be reacting to what's going on. Um, Alec on Facebook asks, he uses a, a, a slang that the kids are using today. Oh, w- these kids today. WTF? Oh, is, I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> WTF is Dexter? WTF is Dexter? What is it? WTF, Dexter has feelings for H- Hannah. Yeah, she's hot, but so was Lila. Why is Dexter being such a pushover with her this season, with Hannah? Have you seen her? <laughs> Go back and rerun the episode. Pause it. <laughs> Pause it, look at it, and, and you'll, it'll, it'll hit you very clearly. 
I don't think he's being a pushover either. Either, I mean, I think he's resisting this because he senses trouble ahead. But there's a, a side of him that just hasn't been drawn to a woman like this before. I mean, with Hila, with Lila, Lila went after him. He wasn't right. particularly interested in her, um, in the same way that he is in Hannah. I think Hannah is perhaps Dexter's first true love. Yeah. Which and is, I, by the way, we and I and, I've, and I see it. I think some people would agree that I, I still see Dexter's very much kind of a child inside yeah and they all he's still going through life is is kind of these are first time things for him like right. like scott said uh, lila pursued him and this is his first kind of real i must have that woman and rita sensation. rita was and rita was, was very was none of those rita was a beard who grew yeah. into something more that he cared right. for right. yeah he certainly cared for her but i don't right. think he ever felt deep romantic love for her. You know, this kind of lust and passion we ha- he hasn't really felt yeah, or at least he hasn't been. He hasn't been the the one initiating it. it feels squeaky inside. It's weird. Exactly. Yeah. And then and then go back and look at her. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another question. Han- Hannah's on a lot of people's minds this episode. Uh, Javier on Twitter asked, "Does Dexter have a thing for blondes?" We got Rita, Lumen, Hannah, the blonde chick from episode six hundred one. That was your mm-hmm. episode. Uh, does he, uh, Javier thinks that there's unresolved mommy issues? I don't think so. Um, it, it never occurred to us. We certainly didn't cast Yvonne because she was a, a blonde. We no. cast her because she was a fantastic was actress. Yeah. And Lila wasn't blonde. She was not. Lila was not blonde. At all. Uh, Alex on Facebook asks, uh, can you talk more about Deb's transformation from being horrified to finding her brother's a killer to trying to cure him and then accept him but complain and nag about previous kills but now is ordering a hit? Does she realize that if she asks Dex to kill Hannah and he complies, she's a murderer herself? Far worse than covering up than the covering up she's done so far. Uh, and he also asks, is she going to see her therapist again? She could use one. <laughs> well, that's the interesting journey of the season, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, to, you know, is is watching exactly those very steps that you outlined: watching Deb be horrified, to understanding, to accepting it, and then finally in this episode, which I thought was came out really terrific, was. Yeah. Her finally ordering Dexter to do what he does for good because she sees the value in it. And it is someone stepping, you know, taking a journey down a very dark path. It is murder she's asking for. And that's part of the what was really fun about this season is taking, you know, Deb down down this path for Dexter. Becoming like her dad. I mean, Harry asked yeah. the same thing of, exactly. of Dexter. Exactly. Almost in the same words. Some exactly. people deserve it. Right. Some people deserve it. Um was, that was a great and moment. some people do deserve it. Let's just face it. <laughs> Even in this room. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jimmy likes tacos on Twitter. Asks, uh, won't the cops tailing Isaac notice who he's having lunch with? He's making reference to when Isaac sat down with Dexter and ate his chips. The cops, I, I believe, in the scene were were a good distance away, and Dexter was facing the opposite direction. I, I, I you know, we, we did think that through when we were writing it and staging it. And I think uh, both men were, were aware of the, the cops, uh, the police's uh, not too close proximity. And they're not homicide cops anyway. I mean, right. there's, there's thousands of police on the. Right. Uh, they were taking a donut break. <laughs> so, so they may not necessarily know who Dexter is anyway. Right. Exactly, right. Yeah. And they're not being tasked with taking pictures or any of that sort of stuff. All right. Uh, Ryan on Twitter asks I noticed former Deputy Chief of Police Tom Matthews' name on LaGuardia's staff list. Wasn't he fired or asked to resign last season? Uh, yes, he was, but she's looking over potential boat owners during the time of the Bay Harbor Butcher, which would be when he was still very active at the force. Right, cops with boats who, yes. who might have, because she's looking for anybody else but Dokes right. to yes. be the Bay Harbor Butcher. Um, the last question here is by Lila on Facebook, or no, Lilja, L-I-L-J-A. Okay. Lija? Lija. I think it's uh, Lija. Thank you. She's been thinking a lot about color design, or he... Uh, I'll just read what this. I've been thinking a lot about color design through all this, throughout the season. There's been a lot of pink, red, blue, and also this beautiful brown. So her question, this question is, is it something you want us to feel by the colors you choose? Something you're secretly telling us by these colors? Something about romance, maybe? And then she puts in, or he, puts in parentheses, Dexter, Dexter and Deborah. Um, I, color choice. I mean, we're very aware of, of color as it goes on the screen. I think red has always been our signature color, yeah. um, and I think that always plays throughout. But as far as other particular colors, I mean, yes, they're used to signify specific moods and stuff. But I don't, I don't know that we have an overall scheme of colors we're trying to push. It's very possible the production designers are, are aware of what they're doing right. and, and are you know pushing these colors. 
Yeah. I know I've asked for more mauve and fuchsia. <laughs> but you're not going to get it. <laughs> but uh, it's a fight I struggle with. Uh, every day. Every, every, every season so far. But they do production designers. They, they come in. Jessica comes in. Oh, absolutely. They show us everything. You, and the they, they run through. Yeah, they run through. This is what this is going to look like. We we all walk the sets before uh, anything is shot. And, and you know, we all work together on, on what exactly the, the look of that scene is going to be. Yeah. I do think that the Hannah and Dexter stuff is does look very kind of romantic and soft and pastel and pretty. And I think that's a nice contrast to what's actually going on between these two. I think that's very conscious and it's, it's really working well. Yeah, I would agree. Good job, Jessica. Well, there it is. Thank you guys for coming in. Thank you. Uh, Glad you enjoyed the episode. It's the end of the eighth Dexter Wrap Up podcast. All right, I want to thank Romeo Tyrone for coming on board. You'll be watching Dexter with a whole new set of eyes now, won't you? I mean, that guy is great. His, his history with the show is uh, huge and prolific. And I want to thank, of course, Rob Galuzzo, a.k.a. Rob G., the producer sound guy for the podcast. Always rock steady. I'm Scott Reynolds, one of the writers here on the show. You can find me on Twitter at jscottamy. Uh, hit me up. I'll answer your questions and queries uh, I'll post up behind the scenes picks too if you're into that stuff. Uh, catch us next week when our guest will be Isaac himself, mm. Ray Ooh. Stevenson. This is an epic interview. Seriously, it's so good. I mean, uh, originally when we it, he's in he's in Ibiza, I think, and uh, when we when we called him up, he goes, "Let me set the stage for you." <laughs> I'm sitting on the beach, the sun is setting, and I, his, my children are playing, and then he had like opera playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> is he coming here? Oh no, no, he's not. We, you get on the phone. Talk to him yeah, yeah. talk about the phone. But it's uh, it is good. The guy's amazing. We turned the opera off, which is you know, what are you going to do? Uh, tell your friends that want to hear this one too. We'll learn how Ray boldly went where he has never gone before. That sounds good, right? Yeah, I want to hear that one. Well, that's it. That's the end. But don't worry, it's going to happen again and again. It has to happen, whether you like it or not. Have a good week. 